Hi everyone, we'll give it another 30 seconds so folks can join. Okay, we'll, we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James Perez. I am the co-chair of the Fair and Impartial Courts Subcommittee. Um, welcome to our latest webinar from the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. This webinar is jointly sponsored by the Committees of Fair and Impartial Courts, as well as the Economic Just Justice Committee. If you like our work, we highly encourage you to become a member of the Civil Rights and Social Justice section of the ABA and collaborate with us on projects we want to see develop and offer to our members as well as to the general public, such as today's program. Today's program, you can ask questions of our panelists, our esteemed panelists, um, by finding the questions drop down menu on the right si right hand side of the panel and typing in your questions. Um, after each panelist presents today, uh, there will be time about 10 to 15 minutes after each panelist pr uh, presentation for them to address questions from you, our audience. Uh, we will be sharing a recording of today's program with everyone who has registered so that you can share widely, widely with your networks. Uh, pl please feel free to also leave us some feedback and or ask follow-up questions. We're thrilled to bring you today's program entitled A Conversation on Bail Reform. I would like to introduce the moderator of today's program, Professor Justin Hansford. Professor Hansford is an associate professor of law at Howard University Law School, where he's been a professor since 2017. His scholarship and expertise focuses on civil rights law as well as critical race theory. He's also the executive director of the Thurgood Marshall Center for Civil Rights at Howard University. Um, prior to joining the faculty at Howard, Professor Hansford held faculty positions at St. Louis University, Georgetown University, Harvard University, and the University of Maryland. Maryland. Professor Hansford recently received the 2019 Right to Fight Award from the Michael O. D. Brown We Love Our Sons and Daughters Foundation. He was honored for his work as a leader in racial and social justice. Perhaps, um, Professor Hansford, most esteemed accomplishment is a law clerk to the Honorable uh, Damon Jane Keefe on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeal, who recently passed. Uh, we're honored to have Professor Hansford today uh, to moderate today's panel on bail reform. I'll turn it over to Professor Hansford. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody to our exciting panel today on the issue of bail reform. Uh, we are very excited about the esteemed panel that we have in store for you today. Um, I want to begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, our first remarks will be made by Professor Crystal Yang at Harvard Law School. Uh, Professor Yang is an uh, uh, expert on issues that include empirical projects on the effects of the bail system on defendants' short and long-term outcomes, racial bias in the criminal justice system, and also the spillover effects of deportation fear in our society. In addition to publications in leading economics journals and law reviews, her work has been featured in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Economist, the Boston Globe, and um, many other outlets. And she has been cited by the United States Supreme Court for her work. Uh, so we're very happy to have Professor Yang with us today. Uh, also with us is Attorney John Matthews of the Justice Collaborative. Um, Attorney Matthews is a senior legal counsel who previously worked as the Assistant United States Attorney in Puerto Rico for five years. Uh, he was a litigation associate at Latham and Watkins in Washington, D.C., 
and also served as a voter protection outreach coordinator for the Obama for America and uh, the Generation 44 Mid-Atlantic uh, Finance Committee during the 2012 presidential campaign. Uh, he was also an inaugural member of the Young Lawyers Network for the D.C. Bar Association and a, a law clerk for Judge Raymond Jackson in the Eastern District of Virginia after graduating from UCLA and Harvard Law School. Uh, John, thank you for being with us today. And uh, finally, we have uh, another esteemed panelist here, uh, Mr. Alex Kareksanis, uh, founder and executive director of the Civil Rights Corps. Uh, he is a graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School, and um, who was, he was a member of the Harvard Law Review. And uh, after graduation, he founded the Civil Rights Corps, which is an organization that I know uh, very well. Um, we met actually in Ferguson um, in the early days there as he came and uh, talked about some of his work with us. Um, he has been uh, well-renowned for the type of work that Civil Rights Corps has done on bail reform. He was awarded the 2016 Trial Lawyer of the Year by Public Justice for his role in bringing constitutional civil rights cases to challenge the American money bail system and the 2016 Stephen Bright Award for contributions to indigent defense in the South by Gideon's Promise. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Um, I want to just give a short outline of the topics that we're going to discuss. Um, I think all of the attendees should know by now what a crisis our criminal justice system has become. And particularly today, we're going to explore the inequality of the bail system in the United States of America. We're going to look at the approaches that jurisdictions have taken to make bail more fair for everyone. We're going to look at the long-term economic and social impact that pretrial detention causes long after arrest. We're going to look at recent studies that indicate how racial bias impacts bail decisions. And we're going to explore how the impact of pretrial detention increases the likelihood of a defendant ultimately pleading guilty. We are going to have three segments led by each panelist, and this format may be uh, a bit outside of the norm for some people. Uh, we're going to have remarks followed by questions and answers uh, with each panelist uh, session. So for example, Professor Yang, will speak first about her topic of expertise, and then Professor Yang will take questions. After that, um, we will have um, uh, Mr. Alex Karakzanis uh, give his presentation and then take questions. And then finally, Attorney Matthews will do the same. So uh, please feel free to engage early and often. You can also submit questions on the uh, questions tab on the right side of your webinar control panel. So that way you don't have to wait until the comments have ended. Uh, if you have a burning question, you can ask it right away and we can uh, make sure it is raised during the question and answer period. So without further ado, I will uh, allow Professor Yang to begin her remarks, and we're looking forward to a, a wonderful discussion. So, Professor Yang. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hansford, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to join this terrific panel today and to get the opportunity to share with you a little bit about some of the uh, empirical research that I've done over the last couple of years 
really trying to understand uh, the pretrial system. So I have some slides that I would prepare that I thought um, could sort of motivate or describe what I've been doing. Um, I'll start off with a couple of key facts that many of you may be familiar with, some uh, may not be familiar with, but which I think are really revealing about uh, the pretrial system in the United States. So what I have here is showing the rate of pretrial detention, which is the number of people detained per 100,000 individuals among OECD countries. And I apologize, the font might be small, but you see you have some countries with very low detention rates on this left-hand side. There are countries like Iceland and Japan. And on the right-hand side, the very right-hand side is the United States, which is an extreme outlier in terms of just how many people are sitting in jail every day um, awaiting trial. And this would be so even if we were to increase our group of countries to non-OECD countries. The United States would still be a world leader in some sense in imprisoning or detaining so many people before trial. So this is just a very stark feature um, of the United States. Now, something else that's been interesting over time is if you look at trends in pretrial outcomes, over the last uh, 20 or 30 or so years from 1990 to 2009, you also see this stark trend that over this time period, the use of release on recognizance or ROR has decreased over time and has been increasingly replaced by the use of money or cash bail, which I'm sure many of the other panelists will be discussing today, as that's one of the primary ways in which defendants um, simply cannot afford to pay bail and it was, as a result are detained before trial. So there's really been a sort of surge in the use of monetary conditions of bail. There's also huge variation across the United States in large counties across the US in terms of how frequently they detain individuals and also in terms of how large their racial gaps are in terms of detention rates. So what I'm showing here on the left-hand side, which is panel A, is essentially if you account for the types of individuals that are arrested and arraigned, um, what types of things they're charged with, their prior criminal history, there are some counties that don't relatively speaking, detain as many people. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, you have some counties that have very, very high detention rates relative to other parts of the country. And those counties are places like LA County, San Bernardino, Orange County, and Harris, Texas, which is on the very uh, extreme right end. And panel B, which is on the right-hand side, what I'm showing you here is racial gaps in pretrial detention. So this is saying, for similar black and white offenders, how much more or less likely are black defendants to be detained before trial relative to white defendants? And what you see is that almost all counties have a positive racial gap, meaning that black defendants are more likely to be detained pretrial relative to white defendants. But again, we have some counties that are extreme outliers and having the very, very large racial gaps. These are, again, counties like Harris County, Texas, and Orange County, uh, California. And so you see there's sort of this interesting positive relationship between places that just generally detain a lot of people, and those are also the places that have really large racial gaps in terms of who they detained. And so motivated by sort of these general facts of the U.S. being a world leader in detention, um, large racial gaps in many places in the country, and increasing use of money or cash bail, one of my first projects on the pretrial system was trying to understand the causal effect of being detained before a trial on a variety of both short and long-term outcomes. And so in this paper, we actually just focused on being detained for simply three days before trial. And we think that that sort of is a really critical time for a lot of these folks who go through the criminal justice system. It's not that even being detained for two months seems to have some negative effects. It's that even three days has really adverse long-term consequences. So what I have here in panel A on the left-hand side is if we look at various types of criminal case outcomes in both Philadelphia and Miami-Dade, which is the site of the study, we see that if you're detained for just three days before trial, you're substantially more likely to be found guilty on those initial arrest charges. And almost all of that is coming from pleading guilty. And often these are people who are pleading guilty to time served. So they're not often serving extra time 
after that initial pretrial period, but now they're pleading guilty and will have either a misdemeanor or a felony conviction on their record. In panel B, we also look at outcomes like, did you subsequently fail to appear at a required court appearance? And were you subsequently rearrested for a new offense? Now in the short run, sort of mechanically, we find that if you're detained for three or more days pre-trial, you are less likely to be rearrested because again, mechanically, you are in jail at that point in time. And mechanically, you're less likely to fail to appear in court. But one of the most surprising findings was that we find that being detained for just three days now, after the case has been adjudicated, you've pled guilty, it's been finalized, several years later, up to four years later, you are then more likely to be rearrested for a new crime. And that may be happening because pretrial detention may be criminogenic in some way. It might be actually severing ties that are important for you in the labor market or disassociating you from the community in a way that is actually leading to more in the future. And so in some sense, this longer term negative effect of more criminal behavior actually fully offsets any short run benefit we might have from incapacitating somebody. Now, the final set of outcomes we looked at in this paper were future labor market outcomes. So we were able to follow these individuals who were detained for just three days and look at whether they were employed in the formal labor market up to four years after that initial arrest. And what we find really large effects is that just being detained for three days substantially reduces the likelihood that you will be employed in any type of formal labor market job, even four years later. And what that also means is that those people who can't be, uh, aren't employed in the formal labor market are also much less likely to take up safety net programs that are tied to formal employment. So for instance, those individuals who are detained for just three days are much less likely to take up programs like the EITC because the EITC requires formal labor market employment. And so one of the reasons we think these long-term adverse labor market outcomes are occurring is because people now plead guilty when they're detained pre-trial. And as a result, they now have a new or additional convictions on their record, which makes it even less likely than before that employers will hire them. And so these are just illustrating some of these really adverse, negative long-term consequences uh, for criminal defendants. So after we did this project, we thought, well, given that there are such negative, large long-term consequences, it's really troubling then that there are these large racial gaps because that means that disproportionately these adverse effects are felt uh, disproportionately among uh, black offenders in particular. And so in a second project, what we wanted to do was test for whether there's um, economic racial bias in these bail decisions made by bail or arraignment magistrates across the country. And so the test that we use is sort of straightforward and hopefully intuitive. The idea is that if judges aren't racially biased, then we'd essentially expect that the last sort of white offender somebody would release and the last black offender that a judge would release would be equally likely to engage in some type of pretrial misconduct, whether that's being rearrested for a new crime or failing to appear in court. But if the last white offender that a judge releases is more risky than the last black offender, that suggests that judges are racially biased because they're essentially holding black defendants to a higher threshold before releasing them. And that's exactly what we find across a variety of misconduct outcomes, that basically judges are over detaining black defendants relative to equally risky white defendants. And a lot of our suggestive evidence in that project suggests that judges seem to have stereotypes about black defendants being far riskier than they actually are, which leads them to over detain black defendants. And when we look at judges with differing uh, levels of experience setting bail, we find that that level of racial bias seems to be really large among the least experienced uh, judges. So these are two former projects um, that we've sort of worked on uh, in the pretrial detention system. Uh, I'll tell you now um, in my last couple of minutes about one of the most recent projects that we're undergoing now, which comes out of the findings from these two projects. And it's an idea of now we're working with real court systems across the country and real bail judges to identify low cost scalable interventions that we think can reduce racial disparities in bail. And so there are sort of two components of this project that we're doing now. 
One is to essentially try to reduce the degree of racial bias that occurs in these quick bail hearings. You know, as many of you may know, sometimes they're just a couple of minutes each, which is exactly the type of setting where you think bias and stereotypes and heuristics might arise. So there's two parts of this sort of intervention of trying to reduce stereotypes. One is we're actually going to give the participating judges in our study judicial bench cards or checklists to try to help them slow down and systematize their decision making process, which then might lead them to less likely to rely on those types of stereotypes. And we're also going to give them more objective information on the similarities in terms of risk of both black and white defendants to hopefully correct some of those exaggerated stereotypes that they might hold of black defendants. In the second part of the project, we're also going to give judges individualized feedback on their performance. This is something that seems to be missing from essentially every jurisdiction. Judges have no idea uh, what their ROR rates were in the previous time period. They have no idea if they're ex they have racial gaps in their bail decision making. Um, they have no idea how they're doing relative to other judges in their court, how many of the individuals they released actually fail to appear in court. And so we're actually going to give judges monthly feedback on how they're doing over time. So just to give you some examples, here's an example of what a judicial bench guard may look like, where judges are obviously supposed to be considering these things, often by statute, but we don't know if they are. And so we're literally just going to give them a checklist of factors that they have to consider and check next to. And we hope that this will slow down their decision making process. Here's an example of what we might give them in terms of some more objective information on defendant risk, where we'll essentially show them that they used actual risk based on data-driven measures of measuring risk, there would be a much smaller racial gap than what we actually see them doing, which means that they must be misperceiving the risk of black defendants relative to white defendants. And then we can give them some tips about ways to sort of close that racial gap. And here's an example of something we might do with individualized feedback for judges, where we can tell them, here are some ways that you can simultaneously reduce the pre-trial misconduct rate, holding fix the release rate, or also increase the release rate while not increasing the pre-trial misconduct rate. And then, of course, we really want to tell judges how they're doing relative to other judges. So we might give them some information like this, where we tell them in the last period what their release rate looked like, compared to all judges in their court system, as well as best judges in their court system, who we think are simultaneously releasing lots of people and also experiencing low rates of pretrial misconduct. And of course, we can do a similar thing where we show judges their actual white black gap in release rates with the goal of moving them closer uh, to racial parity. So that's sort of my pitch of our new project. If you're interested in it, let me know. Um, we're working again with lots of different court systems across the country to actually test out if some of these uh, interventions will work, again, with the goal of trying to reduce some of those racial disparities and limit the adverse consequences of being detained pre-trial. Great, uh, so thanks, so much, Professor. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Yang. I was going to say our initial question, uh, we, had, we had three questions so far. Uh, one question was the request to send citations to your studies, which we will be sure, sure to do. Uh, second question was, will these slides be available after the webinar? So uh, Professor Yang can make her decision whether or not she is able to make these slides available. Happy uh, to the, Yeah, I think that's a yes. Um, the third question here, do judges respond? Uh, positively to the suggested intervention of bench cards and feedback? Have you had positive responses thus far? Yeah, so I would say I was worried when we, we've been sort of talking to a lot of court systems for the last two years and have had several sign up, which I wasn't sure would happen, to be completely honest. And I was wary at first of talking to bail judges about the idea of giving them feedback, especially on their racial gaps. 
Um, but most of the judges we've spoken to have been actually very receptive. Um, and it may be that those are the courts that have reached out to us and are willing to work with us to test these interventions. But they all sort of recognize that there are large racial gaps. They all find it problematic. And most of them have said to us, we would love feedback. We would love to know how we're doing. We don't have this information. And so if you could provide this in a way and build it into our daily lives, even after the project is over, um, we'd be really excited because we really want to know how we're doing and to have tips on, you know, which types of defendants do we seem to be making these decisions that exhibit larger racial gaps and ways to improve. And so I've been really positively surprised, I would say, at the um, reception that we've gotten and the willingness of various judges to, to learn and participate with us. So. Um, also, if any of the other panelists have questions, uh, we're happy to accept those as well. And, and Lua, you want to say something, John? No, I was just testing my mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I have another question. So aside from judges, how could bias from other actors in the criminal justice process possibly affect these outcomes? I know you mentioned there are prosecutors involved as well and other actors. Yeah, I think, you know, most of the studies that we've looked at so far, and I think it's primarily just because of what we've been able to get data on, which obviously makes it easier for us to measure things empirically, has been on judges. That doesn't mean at all that there's not bias um, that's coming earlier in the process. I mean, if we could, we'd love to know, is there bias coming from police? I think there's a large literature suggesting that there are huge racial disparities that come from arresting decisions, decisions of whether to issue a citation versus arrest somebody, which then often leads to pretrial detention. Um, so I'm sure that there are gaps that come from police. I'm sure that there are racial disparities that come from prosecutors in terms of what they charge, what types of bail that they're recommending to the judges. I think in some jurisdictions, judges often rely on prosecutor recommendations. And so if there are bias or disparities coming from you know, prosecutors, then almost surely they will uh, emerge and then sort of carry forward into the defendant's long-term outcomes as well. So an important thing to study. Future. Right. And thank you. Just to reemphasize, so these are individuals who engage in the same activities, possibly have similar, if not the exact same conduct and uh, same charges and get, they, as, unfortunately because of the bias, they get racialized outcomes, meaning more harsh penalties for uh, black defendants and defendants of color than others. That's that right. Correct? Basically, if you take um, a, a black defendant or a, a non-white defendant and compare them to a white defendant who has a very similar prior criminal record, very similar arrest charges for the current offense, you know, age sort of demographic characteristics, in almost every county in the U.S., you see that at bail, uh, black defendants are much less likely to get ROR than white defendants much more likely to get money bail than white defendants, and even conditional on getting money bail, get assigned money bail amounts that are on average something like $10,000 higher. And so as a result, that means that black defendants are going to be detained, more likely to be detained pre-trial uh, than, than white defendants. Yes, thank you. So and the next question asks, does your research also distinguish defendants based on gender and also a uh, Latino person, and if so, any comments? Yeah, so we've definitely also distinguished between um, Hispan non-white uh, Hispanics and Latinos, and we find a similar pattern in terms of Hispanic defendants also getting um, more severe bail outcomes or less advantageous bail outcomes than similar uh, non-Hispanic white defendants. In terms of gender, it's actually a little bit hard to do sort of those splits by gender because there are so few women, as it turns out, that have criminal justice involvement relative to men. But of the places where we see enough women, we find that actually men, observably similar men, seem to get harsher penalties than women. Okay, thank you. Uh, another comment or question, 
Um, have you considered the factor in judicial responses uh, based on the criteria of whether judges are elected, appointed, or otherwise? Yeah, so in the two places that we've looked at extensively, which is Philadelphia and Miami, um, there's not, in Philadelphia, they're sort of appointed but not elected. In Miami, they are elected. We didn't, we found some slight differences between the two places, but not a ton. So we weren't really fully able to explore that dynamic. But in our new project moving forward, there's a lot of differences in whether bail judges are elected or not. And we hope to see whether bail judges from different types of systems like that are more or less responsive to some of these interventions that we that we'd like to propose. Great, uh, question. Um, are there any, uh, excuse me, has this study been used to dis discriminate, or excuse me, has this study been used to demonstrate bias between Latin American defendants and African American defendants? Has ethnic bias been demonstrated through this investigation? Yeah, so I'd say in that second project that I described where we're specifically trying to test for racial bias um, and we find that essentially the last released white defendant is much riskier than the last released non-white defendant, um, I would think of that as pretty strong evidence, um, empirical evidence that there is in fact uh, racial bias and ethnic bias. Excellent. Well, uh, Professor Yang, I think we are at 20 minutes for your presentation. so. Thank you so much for your contribution. Do you have any final comments that you would like to submit? Uh, no, I, I think that's it. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to, to listen to my work. I appreciate it. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, next we are going to go to Alex from Civil Rights Corps. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I wanna start by just talking about Christy Don Varden client of mine who I met on January 15th, 2015. I met her in the local jail in Chilton County, Alabama. And when I met her, she was uh, being confined in a jail cell there uh, after being accused of shoplifting from a Walmart. And she would have been free to go home to her family and her two children. She was a single mother of two if she could have paid a few hundred dollars. But Christy was stuck there because she couldn't afford a couple hundred dollars. And that morning when I met her in the jail, she agreed to become the first person to file a systemic challenge to the American money bail system on equal protection and due process grounds since the rise of mass incarceration. And when I think about Christie's case, and when I have any discussion like the one that we're having here today, I think it's really important to understand how urgently um, this problem is affecting so many people and their bodies, right? So as, as Crystal mentioned, there's um, 400,000 human beings uh, in cages any given night in this country just because they can't afford to pay monetary bail. And it's not just that they're confined in jail prior to trial and all the things that, that the research shows that we just heard, that they're less likely to get jobs in the future, right? Um, they're also um, uh, more likely to commit crimes in the future. They're more likely to get harsh sentences. We know all of those things, but I wanna talk about some of the more immediate stakes for them and their family and their bodies. And, and that requires just mentioning a little bit more about Christy's story. So Christy was so distraught that she couldn't see her children that she was crying and she was crying uncontrollably. And so they took her to a, a room in the jail, a um, little nook in the hallway that doesn't have any security cameras, and they strapped her to a chair and they tased her repeatedly over and over and over again um, until she stopped crying. And I photographed those wounds the next morning when I met her. And I say that because what's happening to people, what we've allowed all of us, you know, I think we're all complicit in this, what we've allowed to happen to people in our cages is a grotesque nightmare. These are places where people are likely to be sexually assaulted, physically assaulted, stabbed and beaten, um, given food that is not nutritious. Um, just a few weeks ago on a jail visit, our organization saw people laying in pools of their own feces and blood and mucus, um, chained to each other, chained to wheelchairs, chained to door handles, sleeping four or five people to the room. I mean, Justin, you and I saw this a lot in Ferguson a few years ago when, when you go in and look at what that local jail is like. We have 3,163 local jails in this country where people are being detained on money bond and the things that are happening to them are, are horrific. Um, and then all of the other things that we kind of take for granted about everyday life, um, the ability to, to go out to a movie, to go on a date, to 
um, hang out with a friend, um, to breathe fresh air, to have sunlight, to have exercise. These are all things that are routinely denied to people just because they can't make a monetary payment. And for many of my clients, they're denied the ability to see the sunshine for many, many months. Uh, I'll never forget my first case as a public defender. My client said to me when I met him uh, in the jail, we, we lost his bond motion. He said, nobody has smiled at me in three weeks. And those are all the little things, the little things that we all take for granted. And that's what this is really about. So that's why we started at Civil Rights Corps challenging the American money bail system. Um, and including Christie's case, you know, we were a part of 10 class action lawsuits in 10 different cities all over the country in the first um, few months of 2015. And the goal in those cases was to convey this sense of urgency, to connect with local organizers and movements who were who have been talking about this issue for years, um, but where the sort of the mainstream legal establishment has been ignoring them, um, but also to show the kind of legal claims um, that, that, that can be brought in these cases. And so with my time today, I want to talk a little bit about the legal claims that we've been bringing and winning against the American money bail system. And then I want to talk about why I think notwithstanding we've, the fact that we've been having a lot of success with those legal claims, why I think we are at a very dangerous time um, in this country um, with respect to what's going to happen next. So we bring really three main legal claims all over the country. Uh, and these are the same claims that we've been bringing in Harris County, Texas, in Dallas, uh, all in New Orleans, in San Francisco, in the state of California, in Chicago, right? These are the, the constitutional violations that you see are actually very similar. Um, the bail system looks fairly similar in virtually every jurisdiction that I've ever watched it in, uh, whether it's in St. Louis, Justin, where we just brought another case, uh, or whether it's in Palm Beach, Florida, where we brought another case last week. So basically the first claim is equal protection and due process. And that claim really gets at the inequality that's inherent in determining whether someone is free to go home to her family or put in a cage based on the amount of money she has access to. And the equal protection and due process case law flows from a line of cases, probably the most prominent of them is Bearden versus Georgia, which is a case in which the Supreme Court said, you can't just jail someone because they can't afford to make a fine payment after you convict them. So what we did in our cases is we took that line of cases and we were applying it prior to trial, saying, if you can't jail someone just because they can't make a payment after conviction, that same principle should apply with equal, if not greater force, prior to conviction. And so um, if you want to jail someone prior to trial because they can't make a payment, you have to have extremely compelling reasons, and you can only do so if there's no other alternative. So that's the first equal protection and due process claim. Um, the second claim is very similar, and that's the claim that the due process clause protects what the Supreme Court has called a fundamental is interest in pretrial liberty. That fundamental interest is a long line of Supreme Court cases, the, the most prominent of which, which is the last time the Supreme Court has addressed the issue of money bail, which is a scandal in and of itself, from 1987, a case called Salerno. And in Salerno, the Supreme Court upheld the Federal Bail Reform Act um, against the constitutional challenge, but in the process of doing that, it said, you have a fundamental right to pretrial liberty. And we're only gonna be able to infringe on that right if we have extremely good reasons, in extremely narrow circumstances, an extremely robust um, process that's provided. So whether we're talking about the fundamental right to pretrial liberty or the equal protection and due process um, claims that we've been bringing, um, the, the, the inquiry is really the same. Does the government have extraordinarily good reasons to put this human being in a cage? Has it articulated those reasons? Um, and has it made a finding that there's nothing else that it can do short of caging this person um, to serve its interest in court appearance and public safety? And as you'll find, if you actually hold the government to that burden, it's very, very difficult to justify jailing a presumptively innocent person when we have all these other ways that we can help them um, uh, get back to court and help make sure that, that they stay on the right track pending trial. And so if you look at jurisdictions like Washington, D.C., um, which operates a large urban criminal legal system, and they release 94% of all people accused of crimes prior to trial. But you go you know, elsewhere, and that's still way too much pretrial detention. But you go to other places around the country that, that we're litigating in, and they're releasing 30% um, of people prior to trial. And there's massive amounts of pretrial detention, totally unnecessarily, and without anyone actually stopping to think, should this person be in a cage? What's happening in most of those other jurisdictions is they're just announcing an amount of money, and if the person can pay it, they're free to go, and if they can't pay it, they're stuck in a cage. The third claim that we've been raising in most of these cases is a procedural due process claim. And that claim is when you make this finding that pretrial detention is absolutely necessary, have you provided all of the rigorous constitutional safeguards that our legal system requires? 
What that means is notice of what the critical issues are going to be at the hearing, an opportunity to present evidence and to confront any evidence that they present against you, findings by the court by clear and convincing evidence that explain the court's decision, um, and then counsel to help you through that process. And what we're seeing all over the country is five to 10 second bail hearings, sometimes 30 seconds, 45 seconds, where none of these rigorous processes are, are being followed. And in fact, a police officer or a DA just reads a state of, uh, you know, allegations, um, puts on no evidence, doesn't, you're not given an opportunity to say anything. In many cases, like in our case in St. Louis or Harris County or Dallas County, you're told that you shouldn't speak and that you can't speak and that if you do speak, you'll be punished. Um, and so uh, you're not given any uh, ability to, to contend or, or put on your own witnesses or evidence. You're not able to really argue to the court that there's this other alternative that, that, that might work and that you should be released to that other alternative set of conditions. And so that procedural due process claim is the third component to these cases that we're bringing all over the country. And we've been winning these cases. So um, you may have heard that we, we won a, a landmark case striking down the money bill system in Harris County, Texas. That's the metropolitan area of Houston. Um, we challenged the misdemeanor money bail system there. Uh, about 20,000 people accused of misdemeanors prior to our lawsuit every single year were detained for the entire duration of their case, just because they couldn't afford a couple hundred dollars money bail. And in the, in the five years before we challenged the case there, um, 55 human beings died in the local jail in downtown Houston because they couldn't afford to pay money bail. 132 people every year tried to commit suicide in that jail. So the stakes are really, really real. And, um, we had an eight-day evidentiary hearing in front of Chief Judge Rosenthal. We put on all of the existing empirical evidence about money bail systems. And she issued this incredible 193-page decision that eviscerates any factual or legal basis for the uh, assembly line modern American money bail system. And we had a similar case uh, um, on, on behalf of Mr. Kenneth Humphrey in California, uh, which struck down California's money bail system. Um, and we, we since then have won cases all over the country on this issue. Um, but one interesting thing has been happening as we've been winning those cases around the country, and that's that we, we've seen that the, the elites and the powerful sort of bureaucrats who control these local criminal legal systems, the people that really created and or tolerated and profited off of the money bail system, we've seen them um, acting to try to preserve all of the essential elements of the money bail system um, using due and different labels. So what do I mean by that? In many jurisdictions, um, people are agreeing with us that, hey, maybe we shouldn't um, detain people just because they can't pay monetary bond, but we should expand our ability to just detain them without money. That's a big thing that we're seeing. So, um, for example, um, there was a federal bail reform movement um, really led by Bobby Kennedy and a bunch of uh, judges uh, in the 60s, which culminated in the Federal Bail Reform Act of 1984, which was an issue in Salerno that I mentioned. Prior to the Federal Bail Reform Act, the rate of pretrial detention in federal court was about 24%. Today, it's 72.4%. So the rate of pretrial detention in federal court tripled, even though we don't use money bail really in federal court anymore. What happened? Why did the system start caging way more people prior to trial? And of course, um, all of the people that are being caged in federal court, disproportionately black, disproportionately Hispanic, and, and disproportionately poor. So it's the same cohort of people, and there's more pretrial detention after so-called bail reform. The same thing is happening in California. So after we won this, this case, um, Humphrey in California, the Attorney General of California started agreeing with us. The prosecutors, um, like the DA in San Francisco, they started agreeing with us. We shouldn't be jailing people just because they can't pay. But they proposed a radical change to California law that said we should be able to detain anyone we want for, um, prior to trial. So Prior to our case, the law in California was clear that you could only order someone detained pretrial if they are accused of a capital offense, a violent felony, or a felony where they'd threatened a witness. But after it became clear that they couldn't use the money bail system to process people quickly through cases, the legal establishment in California coalesced around a change to California law that would allow them to detain anyone they want. Now, why would they be doing that? Why? I think the answer lies in one of the key factual findings in our Harris County case that the federal court found. Chief Judge Rosenthal looked at all of the data and found if you were um, detained because you couldn't pay money bail, you actually um, uh, pled guilty 84% of the time. And you pled guilty in a median of 3.2 days. Why? Well, because you're, you come to court and you're told the quickest way to get out of jail is to plead guilty. Take a fine, go home, see your family, go back to your job if you still have it. 
Um, but for people who could afford to pay money bail, they actually were more likely than not never to be convicted. 51% of them avoided convictions altogether, and their cases lasted 112 days. So one of the reasons we've seen this assembly line money bail system develop around the country is it was the way of the system actors, prosecutors, public offenders, and judges of processing lots of cases very, very fast. No society in the recorded history of the modern world has ever tried to arrest and handcuff and bring to jails and courts such a high percentage of their population. And one of our solutions for processing that enormous number of arrests, about 12 million every year, is the money bail system that coerces many of them to plead guilty within a few days. Everybody in the system knows you're much less likely to take your case to trial, to get an investigator to fight it um, if you're, if you're uh, stuck in jail prior to trial. The second element that we've seen a lot of is um, a lot of the financial interests that have been behind the multi-billion dollar corporate for-profit bail industry, which exists only in the United States and the Philippines around the world. Those financial interests are realizing, they're seeing the writing on the wall, that they can no longer profit as much um, if this bail reform movement um, really takes hold and we stop using money bonds. So what have they done? They and the private prison companies and the private probation companies and the private equity firms have started investing a great deal in alternatives to money bail, um, for-profit um, GPS surveillance and, and drug testing supervision systems. So what we're seeing now is in many jurisdictions, the same companies and aggregations of wealth want to make the same amounts of money off of the same populations of people, but instead of calling it money bail, they want to be the person that sells you the GPS monitor and the alcohol monitor. They want to be the person that you require to visit for drug tests at $15 a pop. And so we're seeing the same um, practices that are given a slightly different label used to surveil and control and extract wealth from the same populations. And that's what really scares me about, about the work that we've been doing around the country. And I think it's something that lawyers really have a difficult time understanding. You, you sort of think that you win a big case. You can win a case even like Brown versus Board of Education. But that doesn't mean that you're going to desegregate schools. And you could have segregated schools 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education if you don't change some of the underlying structures. And I'm very, very concerned with the money bail system. If we don't change some of the underlying balance of power, if we don't change as a culture the way we think and feel and talk about human caging. If we don't change some of the financial interests that are at stake, we're likely to see some of the same outcomes reproduced under a new label. And that's, I think, the message that I really want to leave you with today. Um, it's, it's going to be a really big battle because the money bail system is indicative of a lot of other practices of the criminal system. And it's a manifestation of a bureaucracy that needs to process cases really, really quickly. And that's not about mercy or intellectual rigor, but about processing bodies. So with that, uh, I'll see if there are any, any questions. And I'm happy to address anything about what I talked about. Wonderful. Thanks, Alec. Uh, the, the first question, I believe, is how do the poor conditions of pretrial detention facilities factor into the legal arguments argued in the court? If the conditions are better, will the court be less willing to address the money bail problem? They're not strictly relevant to the legal claims that we're bringing. So all of the doctrines that we've been bringing uh, are arising out of Supreme Court cases that weren't about jail conditions at all. Um, you have a fundamental right to your pretrial bodily liberty, whether or not you're detained in grotesque conditions or not. But I do think it matters in terms of the public narrative. I don't think most people in our society Really, and we certainly emphasize the jail conditions when we talk to judges and when we're seeking emergency relief like preliminary injunctions. But I, I think more broadly, culturally, I don't think most people in our society understand what's happening in our jails. I certainly didn't. And I'm still shocked when I go into jails and I see people all around me chained to each other, um, unable to go to the bathroom, not able to brush their teeth for weeks not able to have a shower or exercise, all of the things that I kind of take for granted in my life, and to see uh, our, our society treating human beings like that. And, and for example, um, there's been a lot of attention around the issue of family separation at the border. Um, but families every single day in 3,000 counties all over the country are being separated from their children just because they can't pay money bail. And that's not a part of our claims legally in court when we're bringing these cases. But I think it should be part of the organizing that all of us do to demand that our local legal systems do something different. Excellent. Uh, another question here. Often in law enforcement, offense 
intake report given to the district attorney's office include race and I and ethnicity in the initial report. As a consequence, bail and related prosecutorial decisions based on race and ethnicity can come into play. Uh, is there a movement or a contemplation to somehow eliminate race and or ethnic identifiers during these initial stages of these proceedings? I think this is a really important question and it gets at something that, that um, Crystal was talking about in her presentation, Justin. Like the, the, we can work all we want to eliminate um, racial disparities, we can remove race from the initial police report, um, but as long as, I mean, I think the bigger sort of antecedent problem is that we're even allowing judges to consider whether to detain these people in the first place. And that's why um, the most important reform that we advocate in all of these jurisdictions is what I call um, creating a narrow detention net. And that means that you should only be asking the question, should I detain this person in a very small number of cases? So like I mentioned in California, California uh, has a detention net in its constitution that you, that you can only even consider a person for detention when they're charged with a capital offense or a violent felony offense or another felony where they've threatened a witness. If you're charged with anything else, you have to be released under California law. So when you, when you say something like that, you automatically say to judges, here's several hundred thousand people who are arrested every year in California who aren't even eligible for pretrial detention. So you can eliminate all of these racial disparities for hundreds of thousands of cases by just passing really strong laws about who is even eligible for pretrial detention. And this is the next fight in the bail reform movement. There are lots of states that have really good pretrial detention nets, and we're seeing prosecutors and judges all over the country trying to pass new laws to expand their detention net. And that's one of the reasons that the federal um, detention rate went up so much from the 80s to now. The Federal Bail Reform Act, which I mentioned a little bit ago, created the, the widest detention net that had ever been created in American law. And not only did it allow people to be detained for any federal drug offense, so if I handed the person next to me some marijuana, I've distributed marijuana, uh, not only did it allow me to be detained for that, or for many other defenses like crossing an imaginary political boundary between two countries, um, another offense that you can be detained for uh, in, in federal law, but it actually presumes detention in most of those cases. There's a presumption of detention in the Federal, federal Bail Reform Act, which is unconstitutional uh, as it's applied uh, in, in cases. It's never been challenged to that effect, um, but essentially. Uh, but if you're in charge of any federal drug offense, you are presumptively detained. And so this detention net question, I think, is by far the most important um, intervention we can make if we care about racial disparities in that initial bail setting. Uh, I think it's, it's gonna be a big lift to do any of these things. I think we should be focusing all of our energy on narrowing the discretion of judges. Because we know that when you give judges discretion to do things, they're gonna do things because our culture is um, you know, permeated and pervaded by racial discrimination, subconsciously and consciously at every turn, whether it's who's being arrested, who's being prosecuted, what the bail decision is, what the sentence is, right? Um, the way to remove some of that is remove the discretion of judges to do bad things, like detain people prior to trial. And uh, I had a couple of questions come in. I, one of them I think you answered. Ha, have you found a distinction in detention rates between crimes of violence and nonviolent drug trafficking offenses? I, I think that was uh, implied in your response. Another question was, directed towards the issue of uh, offenders who have a history of not showing up to trial. Um, I'm guessing in these, um, these, uh, net, these net or, or, uh, these, or these reforms that you've been discussing most recently uh, when they're trying to widen the net, um, I guess this idea of a defendant not having a history of showing up to court would also be a factor. Uh, how, would, how do you respond to to a prosecutor who may argue that uh, if the individual does not have a history showing up to court or if the individual is involved in a crime of violence, there should be uh, some sort of bail process. So one of the biggest, because we've been basing decisions on access to money, nobody has ever been asking the actually, the only question that the Constitution requires us to ask in a bail hearing, and that is, are there other alternative conditions of release? short of detaining this person prior to trial, who's presumptively innocent, that could reasonably mitigate any concerns we have about their risk. And so 
in the past, if people were missing court appearances, it was likely because they were given a monetary bond. And we actually know that monetary bond is not effective at incentivizing people to come to court. And as you know, um, monetary bond ha has nothing whatsoever to do with whether the person commits a crime while they're out on release, because the person can't forfeit their monetary bond even if they do commit a crime. So if I'm released on a $10,000 bond in Houston, Texas, and I go out and I murder someone while I'm out on bond, bond, I never lose my money. So it has no effect on community safety. And so this interesting thing, you know, people often say, but but you know, they have a record of not coming to court. Well, actually, what what that suggests is that our legal system has been relying on a mechanism, monetary bond, that we know from all of the research doesn't help people get back to court. So what we ask is these jurisdictions should be developing alternatives like te text and phone message reminder systems, which are essentially free, and which where they've been piloted, they get people to come to court at like 96% and more. Um, other things that can help people are stabilizing their bed in the homeless shelter, getting them um, safe and affordable housing. Um, um, we, one thing we know is that if you spend two or three days in jail, you're more likely to lose your job. And then you're more likely to commit crime in the future as, as the research that we heard about earlier says. So one other thing that we talk to jurisdictions about is getting people out of jail quickly, promptly. We know that if you're stuck in jail for a few days and you lose your job or you lose your housing or you get off your important mental health medication that you're on, you suddenly become more likely to not appear in the future. So all of these prior histories of not coming back to court are the result the results of a system that was so incredibly broken that it wasn't actually doing things that we know based on the evidence help people get to court. So I place very little weight on those prior um, examples. And if there are those prior examples, we do what we know how to do best. We, we develop individualized case specific release plans for people where they can check in with someone. They can have someone from the community drive them to court. We can give them a bus pass. We can give them a phone. Or if they have a phone, we can text message and, and call them to remind them to come back to court. These are all things that are orders of magnitude cheaper than putting that person in a jail cell, and we actually know they work better. Excellent. Uh, I actually had a question myself, and then we're going to move on to John. I think there may be one more question coming in. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the case law around procedural due process, is there a, any case law that establishes a minimum for due process in these hearings that uh, would be a firm standard for these courts like Harris County to follow, or is there simply no standard right now in sort of sort of the wild west out there? Jurisdictions are definitely treating it like uh, there's no standards, but the cases that we're winning are establishing very clear standards. So people have to be given uh, uh, notice of what's being decided at the hearing. They have to be given an opportunity to be heard, which means they can present evidence, they can have witnesses on their behalf, they have to be given a chance to confront any evidence that's being used against them. And this is really important, any finding that results in the person's detention has to be made by clear and convincing evidence. And the judge has to, with a statement of reasons on the record, it doesn't have to be writing, it can be orally, the judge has to explain why she's making her decision. Why am I detaining you? Here's the reason. Here's why I don't think any other alternatives are going to suffice to uh, mitigate any risk that I'm actually identifying. And when you force judges to go through that process and prosecutors, the detention hearing becomes not a 30 second affair, but a 30 minute affair. And you actually force people to use um, evidence and intellectual rigor. You find that it's actually very hard to, to explain why a presumptively innocent person needs to be detained because there's literally nothing else we can do as a society. And so those procedural safeguards are really, really important for, for lawyers to understand, public defenders, prosecutors, and judges. Um, we haven't been offering them, and they're constitutionally required. And every case that we've been litigating around the country is establishing pretty robust procedural safeguards. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so this is this. this I got one last one that's going to come in. It's a two-part one. So this is the last one for you, Alec. Uh, what are your views on GPS monitor monitoring? And uh, is the rebuttable presumption an additional burden imposed on the defendant? So the rebuttable presumption refers to a federal law, which, which creates a rebuttable presumption of detention in many, many different kinds of cases. It's completely misinterpreted. Uh, the federal courts, when it was first enacted, held that that kind of presumption would be unconstitutional if it were actually a presumption. So instead, the federal courts call it a burden of production. And all it means is that the criminal defendant has to put on some evidence. And once you've done that, the government maintains the burden um, of persuasion. 
that um, holding that I just mentioned from the late, from the mid to late 1980s is completely ignored. Every single federal judge I've ever seen in every single city thinks that there's actually a, rebut a presumption of detention in those cases. They just don't, they've never read those cases and they misapply it um, because they're used to the word presumption meaning something. So that's a big issue in federal court that, that I'd like to um, litigate in, in the future. Um, because it would be unconstitutional to presume that a presumptively innocent person should be detained. Um, and the other question had to do with um, GPS monitoring. Yes, yes. I think this is the, this very, very scary, brave new world. Um, there is literally not a shred of evidence that GPS monitors do any good. There's uh, overwhelming evidence that GPS monitors cause a tremendous amount of harm. It enables the government, for example, to surveil communities of color at unprecedented uh, scale. There's a really great Michelle Alexander op-ed in the New York Times about this, this phenomenon, which she calls e-carceration. Um, and you can sort of see the, the world that we're moving to as people on probation and parole and pretrial um, all have GPS monitors. One thing that judges are starting to do is exclude them from certain areas of the city. They're saying, while you're on your monitor, you can't go into that neighborhood and this neighborhood and that neighborhood. And we, I, you can see the brave new world that's being created. People are forced to pay for their own surveillance that surveillance is disproportionately used against communities of color, and it's used to keep them out of neighborhoods that judges don't want them being in. And I think this, more than many other technologies, has the potential to um, cause profound changes to who we are as a society. And I think that um, jurisdictions should um, not use GPS monitor uh, monitoring in, in really any meaningful right. sense. Um, and I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing is an incredible increase in GPS monitoring. After our bail reform victories in San Francisco, for example, the jail population stayed relatively stable, and the use of GPS monitoring tripled. And now San Francisco has signed a new contract with an Israeli-based defense contractor to provide um, dramatically more GPS monitoring services for the city and county of San Francisco. And that's in one of the most liberal anti-surveillance communities in the whole country. All right. Th thank you, Alec. Um, and now we're going to go to Attorney John Matthews. So, John, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, so I want to I want to thank Alec and I want to thank Crystal and Justin for all the work you guys have been doing around pretrial justice in the United States. Um, my background is, is from being a, a federal prosecutor. Um, I left the U.S. Attorney's Office last February, and I think my starting point is just thinking about what Alec was saying. Um, and I love the way you started with Christy because I think it's remarkable how comfortable we've become with putting people in cages and just the the inhumanity of our system. Um, every time I would show up to court, you would never hear people's names. It was just the defendant this, the defendant that. Um, we've The speed of which these decisions, we arrive at these decisions is also remarkable to me. Um, most of these decisions have happened very quickly without looking at um, the fact that this person is a human being, they have a family, they have a job. Um, it's usually taking a look at the charge, criminal history, um, and, you know, being comfortable with putting someone uh, behind bars. So I love that he started with Christy um, and what her life looked like and what her life looked like after being put in jail um, and the consequences which um, which Crystal touched on just the fact that once you once you go to jail you're way more likely um, to have um, any number of adverse consequences and so I just really appreciate the work you guys are doing. Um, I also love that Alec uh, mentioned you know, you win a big case, then what? Um, the fact that, you know, we're doing really incredible work in this space, but if we don't over time change, really change the culture and the way we think about uh, criminal justice in this country, um, these systems will reconstitute themselves. Um, and so I guess I'd like to start with Alex's question. Does the government have an extraordinarily good reason for putting a human being in a cage? So to back up the work, uh, that our organization is doing. So I'm, I'm a senior legal counsel with the Justice Collaborative. Uh, we are a startup. We've been around a couple of years. Uh, we have we have uh, lawyers, um, policy experts. We have in-house journalists on staff uh, that put out criminal justice uh, narratives through the appeal. 
We have a couple of podcasts. Uh, we have Justice in America actually aired. Um, Alex been, has been on our podcast before with Josie Duffy Rice and Clint Smith III. Um, and everything that we do is about trying to really think about how we can have a more humane criminal justice system um, and changing the narrative over time. So we both focus on the local level, um, both changing um, what district attorney's offices look like, but also look at um, policy change. So once the district attorney is elected, um, helping them think through the like ways that we can create a more humane justice system. Um, but none of this will change anything in the long term unless the whole country is thinking differently about criminal justice is not driven by narratives of fear. Um, you know, typically you look at a news story and it's a sensational murder or a sensational rape. Um, and we really do change laws based on this. Like rarely are we looking at the big picture um, like Crystal painted with, with big data. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is figure out how um, we can create a community of, of people across sectors that are really thinking about criminal justice differently. That's why um, I love that the American Bar Association puts this together and I love the work that all of you are continuing to doing around in this space. So um, the Justice Collaborative, we have a blueprint for a safer and more just America. Uh, we are looking at a bunch of different pillars, but one of them is stop making poverty into a crime. So no person in America should be locked up because they are too poor. Um, I just, to give an example, according to the UCLA's million dollar hoods project, Taxpayers pay one hundred and seventy-seven dollars per day to incarcerate some of the largest that is the most money most novel bond was twenty seventeen last paid the highest rate of employment in the state total in one point four billion levied in cash. Sorry, can uh, you? Uh, John, looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Are you able to um, perhaps double check your internet connection? Okay, looks like you're back, John. Let's let your back. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, um. And also, can you guys see my slides? Yes, we, we can. We can see the. We were seeing the slides a second ago. It might be the slides that is uh, slowing your connection a bit. John, you may, you may want to try without okay, the slides. Okay, awesome. That works better. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a problem. Okay, sure. Let me close out. Okay. So, right now we're focusing on prosecutor accountability. Um, our starting point is that most people don't know how powerful district attorneys are. Um, they also aren't familiar with how most of them are elected. So the, the turnout in many district attorneys races are really low. So part of what we've been doing over time is going into a bunch of different counties, uh, connecting with directly impacted people, uh, grassroots organizers, um, the media, and also meeting directly with uh, candidates for NDA elections just to try to push uh, the importance of pretrial justice, um, the importance of considering, um, the importance of, of decarceration and just considering 
the impacts on people's lives through these systems. And so part of what, what we're looking at is how can we as lawyers use our legal skills um, to push for a change in our system without um, driving the change in the system, right? So when, when Alec was talking about you know, winning the case but not having broad change, part of what we're looking at is how can we connect with local communities, um, figure out what like their needs are in terms of um, either legal or policy expertise, and then figure out how to put pressure on elected officials, um, both in the election context, but also after they're elected with accountability. So one strategy um, we've used is looking at um, any number of issues. So taking an issue, it could be um, cash bail, it could be death penalty, fines and fees, um, and really highlighting for the community um, by pitching stories in media, drafting op-eds, um, getting sign-on letters by academics, but also getting petitions um, from organizers and really highlighting in a, petition, a particular county um, how bad a district attorney is on these issues and showing how different um, a prosecutor can be when it comes to these issues. Um, so I guess, for example, you had in, in St. Louis County, you know, a district attorney who I think had been there, I think 28 years, um, um, this is prior to Ferguson. And then you had community organizers um, organizing around Ferguson, um, prosecutor accountability. Um, and then in the end, you end up getting a DA like Wesley Bell, who's already thinking way differently about the criminal justice system um, and pretrial detention, right? So not, like, I guess I should note, not, nobody is gonna be perfect on these issues, but we think that the more, given the power in this system, the more that we can get district attorneys who care about um, people and aren't just trying to um, lock people up um, for the sake of, you know, toting the classic law and order stance, that the better off we'll be in society. So you have a trend of, of prosecutors who are thinking about this differently um, across the country. And I think everyone here is important for that process because I think as Alex noted, the fear is that there's gonna be a backlash um, and reconstitution when it comes to all of this. So with the ideas without public engagement, um, we could definitely have um, a backlash against all these prosecutors. And you already see backlashes once they're elected. People like DA Rachel Rollins in Suffolk County in Massachusetts, um, you'll have whole articles um, attacking her approach, the fact that she's um, not trying to charge certain offenses, the fact that there's a presumption um, of release for offenses, right? And so I think without consistent engagement of the community and like lawyers who care about these issues, uh, the fear is that we're gonna lose a lot of the progress that we've made. Um, I'd, I'd like to re-emphasize just the fact that, you know, people, why pretrial reform, right? People shouldn't be in jail simply because they're poor. Uh, pretrial detention is a major uh, driver of mass incarceration. Pretrial detention disproportionately of color. I mean, we really have a moment of opportunity um, when it comes to national and local interests and a broad agreement that things need to change. I think the fact that you even had a little bit of, of federal legislation around criminal justice reform, um, it's, it's not enough, but it shows that you could have, um, you know, some allies that were unexpected in this space. So um, the idea that you can combine thinking about humanity, but also think about um, the cost, the sheer cost that the system has is, are ways that we've started to look at it. And so I think in some, you know, think about not just like the legal aspect, but also the, the way that you can connect with other people in your community and, and raise awareness about um, what prosecutors do, how the system works. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about the power of the DA, um, work to support DAs who are trying to create a more humane legal system um, and also um, think about all, there's a lot of groups in these spaces that are, have been doing work for years and rarely get the recognition um, and rarely have the funding, right? So I, if you care about these issues, I would consider you know, contributing to grassroots organizations where you live um, that have been working on pretrial reform. Um, I don't think anybody's mentioned yet, there's, um, there's bail funds in a lot of jurisdictions. So in places where the law is lagged and prosecutors haven't acted, um, there are communities that, that have gotten together to 
create bail funds um, and it's just all community supported. Uh, they look to bail people out who are being held in jail just because they're too poor to pay. Um, so I would encourage you to support those groups. And I think over time, we're really looking to create a new criminal justice narrative. So um, you are all, if you're interested in these issues and passionate about it, um, part of a community of folks who are over time, I, I do believe are gonna change the way we look at the criminal legal system in the United States. Um, so I, you know, I don't wanna take up more time. I, I think people will probably have questions uh, for either me or Alec um, or Crystal. If she, I, I know she had to jump off a little earlier, but I'll use the rest of my time and just think about um, other ways we can improve the system. Thanks. All right, thanks, John. I actually had a, a couple of questions to begin. Have you, uh, from the perspective of the Justice Collaborative, considered judicial elections as part of your strategy and uh, other types of elections outside of prosecutorial elections? Definitely. Um, we consider judicial elections, which are also very important. Um, it's been more of a capacity issue. So, you know, starting with one key actor, the benefit with focusing on on DAs right now is it's it's one, um, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen several ballots where you'll have, you know, it'll be a judge's election, there'll be several, several judges up for election. Um, and I think in, in that space, um, providing public information is very important, but it's a little bit more difficult because as you see in our elections, some of these narratives already get drowned out just by the number of um, the number of candidates, uh, the number of uh, positions that people are voting on. So I think it's definitely worthwhile getting involved in judicial elections too, because and also part of the problem is in judicial elections, most of the judges that are being elected were former prosecutors, right? So like the way they think about um, these issues are typically in the same way, and so the idea is you know, to over time create a pipeline of DAs who care about these issues who will eventually become judges. So definitely I think it's worth focusing on um, judicial elections. I think even if it's, I mean, in the last election that I voted in, there were many judges that were up for re-election. Pretty much everyone I talked to, even folks that had done research prior to the election, didn't know much about the judges that were up. And so I think that is for sure a problem and something we want to focus on going forward. Uh, Professor Answer, uh, this is James Perez. Can I ask, ask a question of Alec as well as John? Um, what if what is some of the pushback that you've seen on bail reform um, throughout the country, and some of the pushback, particularly that you're concerned about? Sure, I guess. Sorry. Um, so, I mean, one example here, here's here's one challenge that we're seeing is um the bail bond industry is you know that's where their money comes from right so like there's been a lot of pushback from bail bonds companies uh, there's actually a, a referendum in california to repeal sb10 um which got rid of cash bail in california it's it's very complicated because we actually think i mean we know that sb10 will result in, in more people being um detained um so it's a complicated situation but i think you know like people who have a financial stake in the system um are going to oppose reform whether that's the bail industry or electronic monitoring or otherwise um i think another challenge that's arisen is if you get rid of cash bail um what replaces it and so there's a, a huge push for um you know these algorithms uh risk assessment tools and we're, we're most of us are pretty confident that these are also going to be uh, racially biased and and not really um, solve the problem. So I think um, you know anywhere there's money involved, there's opposition. I think prosecutors and judges are typically risk averse, and so if you're a prosecutor or a judge, you're looking at the situation. You're saying, okay, like if I let this guy or or woman out, um, are they going to go murder someone? Are they going to commit a domestic violence? You know, so like so these are the challenges that judges and prosecutors deal with every day. I mean, police, the law, law enforcement unions are very powerful, both uh, police unions and um, you know, district attorneys associations. So you're, you know, you'll definitely get pushback from them. Um, but yeah, but I, th I think 
the big some of the biggest challenges are this idea of how we've come to look at the system right and like the fact that we haven't put in appropriate mechanisms to really address trauma and harm and so tip, so a case you get into Raymond and a case is before a prosecutor and if there's any you know indication that they think this person might be dangerous or, or is not going to show the court it's just very easy for them to recommend detention right they don't lose anything um by it but in fact like they're likely rewarded for it in their office so i think the institutions themselves um have the most um opposition and then yeah alec what do you think i've found that the there are a lot of obstacles i mean the the punishment bureaucracy is so metastasized and one you know when bureaucracies become like this um one of their main functions is to keep reproducing themselves and so there's a lot of obstacles whether it's the financial interest that john was just talking about or or the one that i'm about to mention which i think has been um really the biggest obstacle and that's judges um in virtually every jurisdiction I've seen, by far the biggest obstacle reform are local judges for a variety of reasons. I mentioned one earlier, they, they want to move their dockets. They want to, cases to process as quickly as possible. They want the assembly line to function. Um, number two, there's a lot of political pressure on them. Um, you know, They feel like they get hit in the media if they release somebody who then does something to hurt someone else. Um, and as a culture, we don't name the judge's name or criticize the judge when she orders someone to pay money bail they can't pay it and then they die in the jail or they get sexually assaulted in the jail that's not something that's typically blamed on the judge where if you release the person the person does something to hurt someone else that's usually blamed on the judge so they're feeling a lot of political pressure i'm surprised at how many judges probably about 90 percent of the ones that i've talked to and there's many many dozens of judges they'll just say directly to me that they make their bail decisions based on this political consideration about re-election. Um, I was surprised that they would admit that, um, but that they're very open about the political pressures they face. And there's a third thing that's going on with judges that I think is more subconscious, and it's nobody wants to believe that they've been a part of something and that they've been really complicit in something that not only has no justification in, in either of law or empirical evidence, and that's what the money bail system is right it's something that is not justifiable under existing law or empirical evidence the way it's practiced in most jurisdictions but they, they don't want to believe that they've caused all of this pain um, they, they they don't want to believe that it was their decisions and they could have done something differently and it's their decisions that have led to all these deaths in the in the harris county jail it's their decisions that have led to all of these families being separated from their children and so there's a lot of inertia um, and a lot of um, psychological pressure to feel like they they've been doing the right thing for so long that's my sort of uh, my own observations based on um, conversations with many many judges all over the country and then there's a, a group that we haven't talked about at all that that i think unfortunately is one of the biggest barriers and that's the defense bar um, for many many years you know when i was a public defender uh, for four and a half years neither of the two offices that i worked at um, to my knowledge filed a single bail appeal in the appellate courts the whole time I was there. Neither of the two of them filed a motion for release pending appeal of a conviction. Um, even though when I, at the office that I worked, did appeals in, we won about a third of our cases. And it turned out that if our client's sentence was less than three and a half years, she would have served her entire sentence before she won her appeal. And yet we didn't ask for them to be released pending, pending appeal. And my point there is that all over the country, the defense bar has also become really desensitized to the brutality of the money bail system and hasn't approached this issue of pre-trial detention with the level of urgency, myself included. This was sort of uh, a big uh, failing, I think, for my own time in four and a half years as a public defender and never filing one of these motions for one of my clients. And if the person who's supposed to fight for you doesn't care enough about your pre-trial human caging to ask the courts to uh, overturn it, um, it's hard to see how the other actors in the legal system, the prosecutors and the judges, are going to care about it. And so as a defense bar, now in most jurisdictions, or many, many jurisdictions, there aren't public defenders around the country. There aren't even public defenders at bail hearings. I mean, there's some steep structural problems. The defense bar is overburdened and overworked, and many offices tell me when I go around and do these trainings, we just don't have the capacity to do bail hearings and to do bail appeals. So there are structural problems, but there's also cultural problems. We need to be honest with ourselves about whether we've done a good enough job telling our clients stories at these bail hearings, it shouldn't be the case that 
the last Supreme Court case on this massively important issue, maybe one of the most important issues there is in the criminal system, is 32 years ago. And that reflects a defense bar that is not pushing these issues forward. So I would say judges and defense lawyers are the two groups that I, that I think are, are really, really important within the legal system. And, and obviously, um, the big overarching issue is, can we organize these communities to demand that judges and defense lawyers and prosecutors and everybody else um, act differently? So that's why I always come back to organizing communities who are directly impacted, because it's only by building power in those communities that they're going to change the way these bureaucrats and these elites in every local jurisdiction and nationally structure their criminal legal system. It's about power, really, at the end of the day. And so I'm really interested in figuring out how we can use this bail issue to tell these stories, to build connection and relationships, change the narrative so that we can actually build a movement that demands something different. Because if we don't do that, I think we're likely to see a lot of the same legal actors who used to be in favor of money bond, um, who then are going to become in favor of pretrial detention and GPS monitoring. Okay, thank you. We have two questions. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, pose them both, and if you're able to answer them, uh, we have about five minutes left. So we'll see what we can do. So the first question is, I have seen judges push back on reform-minded elected district attorneys primarily because of a feeling of losing control because they cannot touch a case that is never brought. What are the ways that we can support reform-minded prosecutors in the face of such pushback from these powerful actors? The next question is, what about bail jumping? Is there any movement on changing prosecutors' policy on when to charge bail jumping. In our jurisdiction, um, I'm not sure what jurisdiction it is, uh, it is a felony and often more serious than the underlying charge. So any, any responses to these two questions? One question on bail judging, one question on whether or not um, there's something that the audience can do to support reform-minded prosecutors in the face of pushback from other powerful actors? Um, I mean, I would say in terms of supporting prosecutors who are thinking differently about this, I, I, some, sometimes, I mean, they, they receive a lot of pushback. Like, they'll receive calls, they'll receive heat in the media. If you want to write a letter to the editor, if you want to even just, you know, write a letter to the elected, I think them feeling supported um, is important. Um, but I also think, you know, attorneys, like practitioners, um, I think it means a lot when lawyers who understand the system are saying, we don't agree with this narrative. Um, stop, you know, acting like there's only one way to look at our criminal legal system. And just, you know, I think all of you are really important just by raising your voice um, outside of our own circles, right? And just showing, showing up both at the ballot box, but also supporting, like Alex said, communities that are already organizing around this um, and just letting, you know, publicly um, letting folks know that, you know, you approve of, of the change that's happening. Um, I'm gonna think about the other question. So I'll, I'll take the question about bail jumping. So I think by bail jumping, I think the questioner um, is referring to sort of intentional flight from prosecution, um, which is um, exceedingly rare. Uh, it almost never happens. Um, I've interviewed a lot of judges and prosecutors about it. Um, it's it's a, in the low single digit percentages, um, and many of them have never even had an actual case of bail jumping. There are a lot of, of missed court appearances, um, as I mentioned before, almost none of them intentional. Um, it's very, very difficult nowadays to actually evade prosecution with everyone being on the grid and with, with it's just it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and most people actually don't want to do it. They they don't want to incur the charge of, of additional bail, you know, um, flight from prosecution. And also they want to get their case over with. They don't want to have an arrest warrant hanging over their heads. Um, they want to fight their case. Um, most non-appearances that I've seen, a vast, vast majority, are the result of not knowing when your court date is, because many people who are 
charge of the fences, you know, don't have a Google calendar that reminds them of their court date, not knowing where to go. There's tremendous confusion about how the process works, being afraid of what happens in court um, because um, many jurisdictions are like, this is something Justin, you and I saw at Ferguson, um, they knew that if they showed up to court, they'd be thrown in jail illegally. And so people just didn't go to court because they knew that the law wasn't going to be followed in the Ferguson Municipal Court. That's what's happening in many of the jurisdictions that I've, that I've seen all over the country. Um, very, very poor communication um, and communication systems between public defenders and their clients or court appointed lawyers and their clients. And so um, this uh, flight from prosecution issue, which I think is a serious one and really the only justification um, for pre-child detention um, under the existing law uh, is actually exceedingly rare. And so I don't think there's, there's certainly not, to answer the question, there's certainly not a movement to get prosecutors to change their charging policies. Most prosecutors I've talked to um, think that that bail jumping um, very rarely, very rarely even happens. All right, thank you. So we are out of time. So I want to thank all of our guests. Um, James Perez, especially want to thank you for organizing this webinar. Um, Alec and John and the professor, thank you for giving us a viewpoint on bail reform from the activist perspective, from the academic perspective and the constitutional law perspective. Um, and thanks so much for having us today. And hope you all have a great afternoon and evening. Hi. Thank, um, you. Th thank you, Professor uh, Hansford, for mo moderating this wonderful panel. Thank you to the panelists, Alec, Alec uh, John, Professor Yang. Um, I hope the audience enjoyed today's um, panel. Uh, please consider making a donation to the Civil Rights and Social Justice section at the ABA. Um, that's uh, donate.americanbar.org forward slash slash C R S J. Thank you so much. Um, your, your gift will help us uh, put on additional programs like this in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks again, everyone.